Good evening and uh, welcome to Intellectual Publics after that very proggy intro, which uh, our guest Jonathan Stern will explain later. Uh, I'm Ken Wissaker. I'm uh, the director of the program here coming to you from CUNY Graduate Center. And this is going to be a really special night. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank Ch Chelsea Largent for all her work in running the program, even as she writes her incredible uh, dissertation and teaches. Also, John Tianesi for his work and thoughtful assistance on the IT, including figuring out how to bring Prague back to the masses for tonight's uh, episode. Uh, we will have the chat open, uh, but please put your questions into the Q&A so we can uh, find them later. Um, besides my role at Intellectual Publics, I'm also Senior Executive Editor at Duke University Press, and uh, I've known both of our speakers tonight for a long time, having worked with them each on two books. Uh, they're among the most hardworking and 365 degree thinking people I know of in the academy. Uh, you can look at Jonathan's website with uh, advice on how to handle every uh, moment of your academic career or see Nina's tireless work on improving the field, uh, musicology, which is a, a heavy lift uh, and UCLA or um, her work in arranging writing with others. Um, I met Jonathan back in the 1900s, uh, long enough ago that when I heard about his project, I called him at his office, uh, then at Pittsburgh, to talk landline to landline about it. Uh, and that turned into his first book, uh, The Audible Past, which is one of those books like on the author quizzes where you say, what book are you an evangelist for? that has been on mine for a long time. I brought it around and recommended it to people at every kind of uh, meeting I've ever gone to uh, because it's so much changed the way that I thought. That sound wasn't some natural thing that you could hear or not, but like any other cultural object, it exists in a historical frame, as I usually explain it. First person using a stethoscope and that being the only amplified sound they'd ever heard is going to hear it very differently than somebody working at Langone or another hospital now where there's amplified sound all around them. Um, the book to follow also arrived in an aha moment. Uh, the MP3 as a form of neoliberalism. I can still picture myself listening to Jonathan give a talk at the Franklin Humanities Institute at Duke um, and the way that the MP3 outsourced the work to your ear filling it, which then had to fill in the sounds that had been removed from the file. And I proposed a short book on that, thinking like a quick short book would be really great. Uh, the masterpiece that arrived instead uh, was not so short, but brought the form back to the start of the century and the introduction of the telephone. Jonathan's new book is just out. We'll be hearing about that tonight. And um, Nina Einstein has also changed me completely, her work on voice, how we think voice works, how it travels, uh, why do we have underwater opera if the voice goes through the air, how we ascribe race or gender to voice or sound more broadly, or sound to race and gender. All of this has been clear and brilliant. Once, while we were working on her first book, she brought me to UCLA for a program she set up to bring editors to meet UCLA faculty not just music faculty, but across the whole campus. And then, uh, which is kind of typically amazing. And then was driving me to Riverside where I could give two more lectures. And on the way, while she was driving, laid out her four book plan. I was amazed, but in retrospect, I shouldn't have been. Two books in and the next projects, taking the plan to new and unexpected levels, like when we were sitting right before the pandemic in the Korean vegetarian restaurant right next to the Grad Center with uh, jazz genius Wadada Leo Smith, looking at paintings he had painted since the 60s, which were all intended as scores for the music, a book that he and Nina, of course, doing together. Um, sorry to have gone on so long, but I owe both of these scholars a lot. I'm grateful to have them in conversation here uh, more formally. Uh, Jonathan Stern teaches in the Department of Art History and Communication Studies at McGill University. 
He's the author, most recently, of Diminished Faculties, A Political Phenomenology of Impairment, which came out from Duke in 2021. Uh, MP3, The Meaning of a Format, from 2012. The Audible Past, Cultural Origins of Sound Reproduction, from 2003 and numerous articles on media, technology, and the politics of culture. He's also the editor of the Sound Studies Reader and co-editor of The Participatory Condition in the Digital Age. He's working on a series of essays on artificial intelligence and culture. And with Mara Mills, he is writing Tuning Time, Histories of Sound and Speed. Nina Eichheim is the author of Sensing Sounds, Singing and Listening as Vibrational Practice, and the Race of Sound, Listening, Timbre, and Vocality in African-American Music. She's the co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Voice Studies, co-editor of the Refiguring American Music book series for Duke. Uh, she received her Bachelor of Music from the Voice Program at Agder Conservatory in Norway, her MFA in Vocal Performance from Cal Institute of the Arts, and a PhD in Musicology from uh, University of California, San Diego. Aichheim is the UCLA Practice-Based Experimental Epistemology Peer Lab, founder and director, oh, sorry, professor of musicology, UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music, and founder and director of the UCLA Practice-Based Experimental Epistemology, the Peer Lab, an experimental research lab dedicated to decolonizing data, methodology, and analysis, in and through multi-sensory creative practices. Current projects include the book I mentioned with Wadada Leo Smith and a multimodal project that maps networks of metaphors that structure musical community, discourse, and practice. Now I'm going to turn it over to the two of them. And I think even from the uh, rehearsal chat where we uh, got to first hear that important prog excerpt, we're in for a very special and entertaining evening. Thank you both so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to this. Oh my God, thank you so much, Ken. <laughs> it's like going down memory lane uh, to be here with these first few minutes with you. Um, before I uh, turn to Jonathan to ask him the first question, I also just wanted to add to this little trio bi biography, I think um, we kind of heard. Uh, that Jonathan uh, was so kind to introduce me to Ken way back. And um, Jonathan was one of the first people who understood my first book project. And, uh, and that's how the connection to Ken was made. So thank you, Jonathan. And uh, Ken, I also remember our very first meal together. So lots of meals, lots of uh, conversations. So reading, <clears throat> reading um, diminished faculties, I can't hold it up here. Um, uh, it was a little bit like going down a, a, a memory lane, a word I just used. Um, so many of the scenes I, I had been present to, whether physically or uh, in the mind, because I've heard about them from Jonathan directly. And I bring this up because we're talking about voice today, and the conversation might go broader, but that's voice is part of the title. And um, this field or this area that now people don't flinch uh, saying, voice studies, uh, was not really a thing when I started doing my work. And I don't think it was really a thing <clears throat> when Jonathan and I started talking. The first time I heard it used was in 2009 when I was invited to UC Berkeley and Jonathan, you were uh, simultaneously invited there by somebody else. And uh, Robbie Bears, who is now at uh, in Istanbul teaching at the Technical University there, uh, used it. He said, it's so interesting, this voice studies thing you do. And I said, voice studies? We do voice studies? I had been insisting on working on voice, but I, um, I think I would say at that time, people didn't put studies behind every word. It, was, it took a little bit more to put the studies behind the term. But <clears throat> so Jonathan and, and my friendship and collegiality formed very much around the formation of, uh, of voice studies. And we have all these moments together that I think you will bring up and I might bring, and I'll bring up some Jonathan around this um, time, 2008, 9, 10, 11 in California and Southern California. 
And um, one of the, the first time we had a chance to really talk about voice was when I invited you, um, I and Annette Schlichter, a colleague from UC Irvine, we invited you to come to UC, the UC Humanities Research Institute, where we had a little um, invite only seminar trying to talk about voice through disciplines. And David Goldberg, uh, the director of the UCHRI, had given us the funding to bring the scholars we could find that kind of thought about sound voice from this um, more materiality perspective. So Jonathan was, of course, one of the people we was at the top of our wish list. And it was a really formational moment besides the work that you presented, um, which was not um, about the things you write about in uh, diminished faculties. There is a foundational moment that happened at UC Irvine, which is where UCHRI um, is housed. Um, and that formational moment is uh, talked about here. And I'm wondering if you could introduce that and tell us, bring us back to that time, Jonathan, and talk to us about what it felt like um, I won't say the word, but what it felt like to do the thing that you're going to talk about now for the very first time in public. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, first, uh, thanks, Nina. And uh, thank you so much to Ken and Chelsea and John and everybody involved in intellectual publics. Uh, I'm coming to you from the unceded territory of Jojage also known as Montreal. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for coming and, and joining us too. Before I answer your question, Nina, as long as we're going down memory lane, I have a story about Ken and specifically my imagination of his voice. So I was, I, I had given Duke a February, like a promised delivery date of February, uh, probably February, 2001 for a revised audible past, um, which, you know, I was a rookie. Like I had no idea what I was doing, like deliver an assistant professor, delivering a finished manuscript of anything in February seems, uh, foolish. Uh, and I remember I called him on the landline cause that's what we had, uh, and I was so mortified that I was going to have to deliver it in May instead of um, February. And I, I know that this isn't actually what happened, but I swear I could have put the phone down and I would have heard the laughter all the way from North Carolina in Pittsburgh at that time. I was so mortified. And Ken was like, what, you're going to be a few months late? Like, you know, we have authors who are years or decades late. Um, so that's... Uh, Anyway, that uh, that in that story, Ken's uh, laughter looms large in my mind. Okay, so that conference, I think I was presenting on Auto Tune at that conference, if I'm not mistaken, which is also still unpublished. That's a that's a whole other story, but um, yeah. So uh, I was excited to go to a conference on voice that wasn't like sort of rooted in the metaphysics of presence and like aren't voices uh, special. I mean, they are special, but. Uh, and uh, I had had uh, I had acquired a paralyzed vocal cord in November of 2009 uh, when I had uh, large um, large uh, tumor removed from my throat. This is this story is in the book. Uh, basically, cancer ate my right recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is the the laryngeal nerve allows uh, or or uh, controls the vocal cord. So mine move like this now instead of like this. I was learning how to talk again. I had speech therapist and, and all sorts of other assistants, but uh, I also learned through her, her name's Glenda Falovich, deserves the credit of this idea of a personal portable speech amplifier. And here's one, uh, you always got to decorate. This is from... This is a um, sticker from a friend who was nine and is now, I think, 19. Uh, when the um, sticker's still on there, good quality stickers. Uh, and uh, I was figuring out how to give talks again. So, you know, I used to do the American thing of like standing up to declaim. And I used to have a real, I mean, I still have something of a powerful voice, but I really had a powerful voice before I would lecture to a lecture hall of like 200 students with no microphone and things like that. It's just not possible anymore. And uh, so I was learning how to speak in public again. And I was like, I remember there was this, uh, 
what's it called? Um, pop conference, like the EMP pop conference that was U at UCLA. And I remember giving the talk, I was like gripping the podium, but then we did the Q and A sitting down and Ann Powers came up afterwards and complimented me on my performance in the Q and A. And it was at that moment I realized that I needed to sit down to present. Um, and so instead of standing up to present, I sat down and I have and this device along with a headset I wear, which I won't put on because it's would be over my headphones, which makes no sense, uh, amplifies my voice in the room and means that I don't strain it, I don't blow it out as fast, I don't exhaust myself. And so this thing became a topic of discussion at the conference. I remember uh, Mara was really excited and wanted to like hold it. And, and I mean, it's not, it's not a piece of high technology. We're basically talking about a transistor radio that is not a radio. Uh, you know, you just got batteries in back, there's a recharger. And, uh, you know, at first I, I was really kind of skeptical of these things in the sense of like, I didn't think that they were that much of an achievement, but actually they're quite uh, profoundly useful for me. Um, so yeah, that, that conference was the first time I was sort of in public academically with a speech amplifier. Uh, and the thing about being me is because I write and talk about sound and people know that I do that, Wearing a speech amplifier means I have to talk about it uh, because if I don't, people think I'm making some profound theoretical intervention in something. And I actually early on had several experiences where I just went and did it and didn't explain it. And people thought that I was like doing some kind of performative thing, which of course I was unintentionally. Um, so yeah, it was a really formative conference for me, not just thinking about the voice, but also uh, relearning how to inhabit my own voice. Um, yeah, I was a really memorable, uh, that was a, that was a really memorable moment. Also, it was, you know, just beautiful there. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Nina, like you, I mean, it's, it's a silly question to say, how'd you get interested in the voice? Because obviously like you came in as a singer but what the story I don't actually know is how you shifted from practice to uh, scholarship of the voice, right? And you're still a you're still a vocalist and a voice teacher and all that. So it's not like that's gone, but you could have just done that and you chose not to. And do you was there a decisive moment for you where you're like, I have to I have to step back and like really reconceptualize this thing? Yeah, I don't remember the date, but I, I know I'm, I know the year. It was in 2000. 2000. Oh, my alarm. Um, <clears throat> and um, what happened? Well, so Ken said, as Ken said, I um, the first part of my education was in the Norwegian Music Conservatory, and the pretty conservatory, conservatory, and <laughs> you know we learned the fach, the the repertoire. And um, so I had, I guess, some unsettling moments first. With one was that I think it was the first time I felt more aware of my race um, being different in Norway because um, Norway was so homogenous that the few of us who looked like me, Asian, um, everybody knew we were adopted to, to Norway from South Korea was a whole, um, and a wave, a group of, of ch ch uh, children who were adopted from South Korea to Norway in the 70s and 80s. So again, because it was so homogenous, only, <laughs> only one of us, we would be those kids. People even thought I was from Africa because I had black hair. So, um, so I was normalized in a strange way because there were so few and because we ate Norwegian food and the whole thing. So when I started to train in this white European repertoire, it was the first time I felt that people thought about my body together with white bodies. And I had not had that feeling before. And that was a strange, it was a very unfamiliar feeling. So it was just sitting with me. And what happened then was that I, I just started to do a lot of contemporary music. Um, even though nobody did that at, at that school, there was not really any, the faculty didn't know how to teach me that, but I just did it by myself. Try, because there were no characters connected to that the repertoire that I chose, not no yeah, uh, 
And then I went to the California Institute of the Arts, Cal Arts here in, Calif um, in LA, because I wanted to do interdisciplinary work. And in 2000, I met George Lewis, who I believe is maybe on the call. And it was the first time I met somebody who um, was a musician, who was a thinker, a sound artist, a philosopher, a, a you know, thinking creator. Um, somebody who asked questions around the practice and somebody who asked questions around what does it mean to be on stage? Uh, what does it mean when this body or that body makes those sounds? How are they heard differently? And I had had all those questions, but I just thought they were dumb questions. I thought they were questions just because I had a problem. Um, so he really showed me that that was <laughs> that those were questions people asked in the conservatory. There were no musicology, there were no be, no critical thinking around the repertoire, so and around the practice. So that was the moment. Not that I thought that I needed to change. I just realized the potential um, of where I was, and I think I I practiced voice because I had questions around voice, and now I started to ask questions that I can take back to practice and so on. And I had already at that point, asked a lot of questions and explore them through practice in terms of how sound is made. <clears throat> because in classical vocal production, and I think um, other, vo other sound productions as well, there's very much this ideal of the sound that we then try to achieve. I always have this image of this beautiful sound here that I'm trying to reach in terms of the classical vocal production. And the body is just in, in service of that sound. And I started to think um, or ask myself, what would happen if I did it in an opposite way? What would happen if I just did something with my body and just allowed the air? I mean, you are describing all this so beautifully in the book from a very different you know, place, Jonathan, and we can talk more about that. But you know, if air escapes through the vocal folds and the vocal folds have no obstruction in terms of being able to vibrate, there will be necessarily a sound. Um, there are all kinds of sounds that can create, be created then. And then that sound is shaped, you know, funneled through the oral cavity, first through the trachea and the oral cavities and the lip and the tongue, you know, goes up and down and creates an E or an A, the lips, etc. So if we just do this whole, which I've called vocal, inner vocal choreography, if we just work with that, then we can ask what sound, or we can just stop and listen, what sound will happen when we do certain vocal choreographies. So that way I had already worked, but I just thought it was like dumb. But then again, George Lewis kind of showed me and I showed so many of us how all those questions and practices uh, belong together and um, that we really should um, put them all together and think and do and be to uh, and create communities around around them. So that's that's that moment, and I still feel like writing and singing and moving and are more. It's not one or this one of the same, but it's like different aspects of the same thing. It's like all these different writerly voices you are using allow you to say different things about the same thing. Same in terms of uh, investigative or um, foci, I guess. So maybe um, I can ask you an originary question besides the introduction of the Dorcophone to the Jonathan Stern scene. <laughs> because I, I don't know, Jonathan, like you were, you were the sound guy, the sound guy, sound studies guy at that point. I just looked it up, but now I forgot. So Audible's, um, Audible past has been cited on three to 4,000 times. So you're the person, and then um, this thing happened to your voice, and you had to really think about your voice, and you had to work with your voice, not because you were the sound studies person, but just because you were you. And I wonder if how you felt, you, you, you show us here how you really dug in and, and investigated this from you know, your medical, personal medical point of view, and your emotions, and the fatigue, all those, aspects but i wonder like was there any resistance in terms of actually starting that work and sharing that work publicly although i know you're a very open person but actually to do scholarship scholarship not just share uh, did you feel like you had to and uh, what was the feeling around that or were you <laughs> excited uh, was that like the up, upside of this whole 
very uh, very hard ordeal that you didn't know the outcome of it 10 years ago and and you're still living it i know yeah thanks yeah and i am still living it i just uh well maybe we'll get into the we'll get into my actual body later if necessary uh but i'm still very much living this uh it's that's a great question um and thank you so you talked about overcoming resistance I would say I had to overcome a lot of resistance in myself. Uh, first of all, the writing about voice, like when I started, and thank you for all the kind words about like being the sound guy. I I actually think there were a lot of people at the time doing it, which is why sound studies became a thing. And I, And that's not to be like, I mean, I'm proud of the audible past. I'm proud of uh, what, you know, um, uh, that others have found value in that book and stuff like that. So I, I'm not discounting that in any way. Uh, but I also don't want to discount other people's work, like Emily Thompson's Soundscape of Modernity came out a couple months before, and we got reviewed together a lot. We really, like, both of our careers really benefited from our association with each other. And she had family in Pittsburgh, so I would see her pretty uh, regularly. Uh, Doug Kahn was doing all the stuff around sound art and like trying to build up that world. Michelle Hilmes on radio, like there were people, uh, Karen Beisterveld, Trevor Pitch, like there were all these other people that I want to, uh, uh, that I will, and of course all the film sound people were, the, those were the first people to use sound studies. Um, so I don't think it was Rick Altman, I think it was somebody in a Rick Altman collection, but um, the first thing I ever said about sound studies was there's no such thing as sound studies. Anyway, I'm reading all that stuff in the 90s. And in communication, there was this real bias towards like this McLuhan Ong thing, which clearly in the beginning of the audible past, I have a bee in my bonnet about. And there was so much tied up in phenomenology and specifically, um, uh, specifically, uh, like a, a phenomenology of the voice, which comes out of this sort of uh, Christian mysticism, which I has no purchase with me. I wasn't raised in that tradition. I'm not a believer. Uh, and then, uh, and then McLuhan, which like some of that stuff is just outright racist. And uh, like making that point, it's still sometimes difficult to make that point in, in Canada, as you might imagine. Uh, so I you know, Audible Pass was really like anti-phenomenological. Plus, I had just been like drinking a lot of Foucault in graduate school. Uh, and so it was very anti-phenomenological. And there was a lot about voices, but it was all about voice from this sort of position of exteriority. And uh, voice as this thing that's produced in the world. And uh, one of the things I actually learned from you is how to synthesize that with an idea of like a vocal subject, right? Because in... Uh, sensing sound you have this whole like what it, you know we think we know what a voice is but really what is this right sound needs a medium it needs a body it is situated uh, and voice is not purely a sonic phenomenon and for me that was really freeing in a way to sort of say here's a new ground I can stand on and not have to deal with um, not not have to deal with that uh that legacy that I really felt burdened by, you know, I think, I think it's a common thing in grad school to have a thing you're writing against as well as a thing you're writing for. And that was, you know, and that's productive, like, uh, so that was productive for me. So um, I am deferring on the personal question. So let me get to that. Uh, I, you know, conducted my illness in public, pretty much. I blogged it. I talked about it on Facebook. I had an email newsletter going for a while where I'd send, uh, send it to people. And a lot of that practice has fallen off. Um, and there are actually, there are reasons for that. But uh, um, so I wasn't shy about it. But I didn't initially, I was extre initially extremely resistant to writing about it because I had all these people telling me, oh, you know, you write about sound, you write about voice, you should write about what happened to your voice. And I didn't want to do it um, in part because I have this line on all my syllabi, like you're welcome to bring personal experience to class, but if you bring it up, people can differ with your interpretation. Uh, 
So if you're not comfortable with that, don't. If you offer it thinking you are and discover you're not, tell me and we'll move the discussion along. Um, you know, as a way, anyway. Uh, and uh, I was sort of holding myself to that, which is simply saying, I uh, I don't really want to talk. I don't want to put myself on display that way in an academic setting. And actually the first chapter, the degrees of mutinous chapter is something that I have, I don't think I ever presented that in public. Like I had people read it and give me feedback. I don't think I ever presented that live to an audience, nor do I intend to. Uh, the closest would be a sort of recorded thing I did for the Encuentro in maybe 2014 or 2015, something like that, uh, where I was the footnotes to a manifesto for diminished voices. And it was just like, I was stealing a, a trick out of David Toop where he'd give talks that were just the footnotes. And so it was like all these footnotes on voice, uh, one after another. Um, and then, uh, uh, where was it going with that? But then I was also like teaching this disability class and reading all about disability and starting to see like, okay, theorizing from experience is important. I have something to say. Um, you know, eventually, like, Kathy Mizell's multivocality maybe came out in 2020, uh, something like that. But, like, I wasn't aware of her work, actually, until you told me about it. Uh, and it came pretty late in the process. So I wasn't seeing a lot on voices and disability studies. And I wasn't seeing a ton on disability and sound studies apart from, you know, the usual suspects like Mara, uh, Mara Mills. And I, I mean, later on, you know, now you have tons of people writing on sound and disability. I love like Mac Haygood's stuff on uh, tinnitus and Bill Kirkpatrick, Crip Voices on the radio and stuff like that. But that was just coming. So the book went from something, I went from not being something I wanted to do to something I had to do. Um, and it was really, there was a moment, I want to say in 20... I want to say it was in 2016 or 2018 where I was really not sure what the next book was going to be like, what's the next thing I'm going to finish. And um, I was talking with some people and in a couple different situations, people were like, you have to do this book. And I decided, you know what, I'm just going to listen to them. And Courtney Berger, also a Duke, um, was also really insistent that that should be the next thing. And I'm pretty good at doing what I'm told. Uh, you know, uh, this, you give the student the assignment and they deliver it. Um, but it was a real struggle. The, the, first chap the first two chapters really like just getting that into shape was certainly six months of like um, suffering. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever written. Uh, there are also things that you'll notice aren't in the book. Netta Alexander said to me, you know, you never talk about trauma. And it's true in part because that I, I just don't want to put on display for people really. And also because I feel like other people have done that really well in disability studies. And like, I'm not, I don't like, I'm able to occupy a different position by virtue of being disabled rather late. I mean, not late. I still got plenty of career left, but like all after being already established and stuff. Um, and uh, from a, a position of relative privilege that I could use to like inject more humor, um, but also more self-doubt and um, distancing in a way that I don't think like an emerging writer, like this is, uh, Diminished Faculties is not like a first book, book, I don't think, uh, for anybody. So, so yeah, that's a long answer uh, to say, like, it was a real struggle. I was really resistant at first. I had to, I had to have a new, like, ground to stand on for voice, uh, and you were a huge part of that. And I also just had to decide I was going to like resettle my accounts with phenomenology and take it much more seriously, um, which I did. Um, and that that's, you know, an engagement with disability phenomenology and feminist phenomenology. It's not Husserl and Heidegger and um, Mary Lou Ponty, although I had my time with them. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's sort of 
if, yeah for the emotional part of the book that's that was it but like writing about my voice was emotionally hard and writing about fatigue at the end was like actually conceptually impossible from a phenomenological standpoint um so uh so yeah that's uh that's my story <laughs> thank you interesting because yeah. I, I when i was reading it i thought because i had some i started by saying it's a little bit like a biography in a way like a shared biography when i read all these stories and i remember the events around them but <clears throat> then there were parts i thought i've never heard this because i've heard you give so many papers around different things and and i'm proud to say jessica holmes and i um published maybe the first a little a little part um of some of the ideas here mm -hmm. the dorkophone and um, in a special issue that we call um edited so i knew that material intimately um but then there were things i had i didn't know you were up to so i thought have i have i not <laughs> have i not paid attention but now you said there's some you haven't even um uh, presented at all so thank you yeah I have lots yeah, of yeah. questions to you, but uh, I don't know how you well, want to I wonder if ask maybe, you more. yeah, one of the things we were talking about, we're sort of going there is talking about process. Yes. And maybe this would be the time to go there. And you did yes. this first. So I get to ask you. Oh, uh, I was looking you for turn, turn around at me. But you're very good at like both inserting and withdrawing yourself from the prose description. Right, so the Juliana Snapper underwater water opera essay, which became the first chapter of uh, Sensing Sound, uh, you're in it. Like you're you're a character in it. Like it's not. I mean, it's not ethnographic, but it's like there's uh, there's definitely a phenomenological dimension to it. And so I wonder, as a writer, how you learn to negotiate, like putting yourself in and pulling yourself out. Um, and also the the chapter, I just have to say, the chapter is wonderfully mimetic because you see, okay, underwater opera and the first response I have is like, what the fuck is this? And then your first thing is like, you're probably thinking. Um, and by the end of it, it like total, I mean, that's the that's the the brilliance of the piece is that like by the end of it, you're like, well, of course, this makes perfect sense. What happens when you sing underwater? Uh, but I wonder if you could talk about that, like decision to sort of put yourself in there rather than talking about it, right? You, you could imagine a musicologist writing about Julia Sna Juliana Snapper's opera without inserting themselves at all. Right, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I also thought, what the fuck is this when I got the first invitation uh, to Juliana Snapper's Underwater Opera? And, and I'm so happy to say she's a collaborator still today. We just finished a piece together for Opera Quarterly. So another is our second. So shout out to Juliana. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I think that there's no really um, a question of being a character or not. I think in if one takes the thesis of Sensing Sound seriously, if singing and listening is a vibrational practice, how could we not be a character? And I think especially for underwater opera it just it's nothing really different than going to the opera and not say i went to the opera but i heard just talk about the piece you heard at the opera right but it somehow i guess i had to say i went inside the water to hear this uh, music <laughs> because otherwise i wouldn't be sharing the medium or the materiality then the transmitting materiality with juliana and with the other participating members so so that's why I I, I leaped <laughs> I went and it was an amazing place that um, if you ever come to LA any of you here we should all go <laughs> to the standard hotel downtown they had this amazing pool on the roof so that's why we did one of the uh, iterations and um, yeah you have to be in the water as you have to be at the opera house or in the car with your speakers or wherever you are listening to music. So it was simply another day listening to music. And, uh, you know, the genius of Juliana is that she, she puts her life on the line, literally and metaphorically and artistically and in all kinds of ways. And, um, and she really investigates voice in a way that I have, I have not gone all the places she has physically 
far from. But then she gets, she takes us, she's so generous that she makes art for people and she takes us with her. She makes the kind of art that really brings people with her. And um, that's why it's so, she's such a pedagogue, she's such a theorist, she's such a philosopher, uh, she's such an artist. And um, I think she, by with that under, underwater opera piece, she, a project, she really just opened up voice, the question of voice for all of us. And she showed us what's there all along, you know, that sound and voice is transmitted through specific materiality at a specific moment in time in a specific relationship. So that's why I had to be in that scene. And thank you, George, for putting Juliana's uh, link here. It's so late. She's in Turkey now. Otherwise, she 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 would have been here. But it's midnight, past midnight, and I passed one o'clock there. Um, <clears throat> but I I've learned so much from you in terms of the writing, and I'm going to do something now. I'm been looking so much forward to this. I hope it works. Let me see. Um, basic. Um, here, here we go. Okay. So when <laughs> when I had not written uh, any books yet, oh, and I forgot to say that I wrote that book three times, Jonathan, because I just couldn't, I tried to write it in two different ways outside of it. And I, because I thought it would just seem like a cheap move, you know, to be inside it. But I had to, I had to throw out those two entire books. That was a very, very disheartening, but I'm better for it. So this is Jonathan Stearns first book audible past and i was so taken by it and i learned so much from the content of it but then i you know i needed to write my own book i wanted to write my own book and i thought like how do you write a book and i again I, I, that introduction i read it so many times and i thought i'm just and as a good musician you know um <laughs> uh, uh analyzing pieces i just thought i just need to analyze the shit out of it <laughs> trying to figure out what he did so that's what I did, paragraph by paragraph. I just analyzed <laughs> that chapter and other chapters as well to learn. So this is how influential um, you have been in all kinds of ways, Jonathan. And I, I show this to people all the time, you know, when I teach writing, just like to really understand, you just need, like, look at Jonathan's work here. Look at how he, how he did this. So I wanted to ask you a question about voices and ways of organizing text and ways of communicating because this is kind of other parallel path that we have both been in been on that we i think we're, yeah we're just both very interested in writing and um like i said i learned this kind of writing from you this very organized like um art type of this is a scholarly writing i would say the introduction um, it's really well written, more <laughs> better written than a lot of scholarly writing, but still it's organized. It has that kind of a DNA. But in diminished faculties, I find that voice and that organization here too, but it's not all over the place. There's so many writerly voices here. And um, there's so many ways of organizing the text. There's so many forms, um, although it's really divided into chapters, distinct chapters, so that's known, that's something we can have a handle on, but then once you go into the chapter, it's not always certain what you will give us, what's inside that package of the chapter, and then you have a user manual in the very end, which I'm not sure if it's a chapter, it might be, yeah, it's something else, it's a user manual. Um, one, if you haven't read the book, um, there is an imaginary um, exhibit as well so they're really like ways to move through the content and through the text that engages the reader in ways that um i don't think the reader is um prepared for when they buy this book i, I was not prepared for it even though i i knew so much of it and i knew so can you talk a little bit oh the last part is um is the non-textual communication which are images and charts and layout and uh, not colors, but like hues uh, in them. I, <laughs> I love books. So I have the Kindle version, I have this version. I want there to be an audio version. I don't think there is an audio version, is there? I didn't even check because I thought there wasn't. I would love an audio version because I need all the different versions to get to all, to get to it. You know, you read each format in different ways. 
So how did you make these decisions and how many things did you have to cut and how difficult was it to make these decisions and uh, maybe what were your, um, some of the intentions that you, like uh, I can imagine that you did the imaginary museum in different ways before you, you know, came to that. You don't have to answer all of this, but can you walk us through maybe one or two examples of um, coming to the format? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh... Well, Ken has this line and Ken has a talk about like doing your second book where, you know, like you think you know how to write a book after you finish your first book. And then it turns out you don't know how to write a book. Well, it's also true for the third book, uh, at least for me. Uh, and especially this book, you know, because it begins with my own experience, I knew I wanted to begin where the book begins. The book doesn't actually end where I wanted it to end either. Uh, and I'll talk about that. Um, so I knew I wanted the book to begin with like me not being conscious, but not being sure of my own consciousness and its location and things like that as a way into like as a sort of uh, formal performance of the phenomenological argument of uncertainty rather than groundedness for the reflection on experience. So pretty early in the project, I figured out that the different chapters were going to be styled differently. Um, and they all just sort of evolved because, I don't know, I'm, my writing is actually quite improvisatory, which is you're not seeing the improvised writing. You're seeing stuff that's like super, super, super revised. Uh, so uh, thank you for reading the intro to the Audible Pass many times. I wrote it many times. Uh many, many times trying to get it right. Uh, and I imitate other writers as well, uh, badly, kind of intentionally badly. I mean, it's the, that I don't know who said this, but there's a line about musicians and original style coming out of failure to imitate other musicians. And that's sort of like, so I sort of intentionally badly imitate people all the time in my writing. Uh, and so... The first chapter had to be written the way it had to be written because I was trying to tell a story and undermine my own credibility in telling the story at the same time. Uh, the second chapter had to be sort of in the frame of crip humor because I call the thing the Dorcaphone. Um, although I have a new one, I don't have it to show, but I've been working with an artist here. She's uh, um, uh, Alexis. Uh, she's discussed in the book and you can see pictures of it. Uh, um, I think we're going to call it the Sprock Pump Mark III. Uh, and it's like much more stylish, but like she brought it to my office. It was finally done and we turn it on and there's all this radio interference because she's an artist, not an engineer. And it's like, oh yeah, of course the thing needs shielding. Uh, but you know, you don't know till you know. Uh, so I do not have the Sprock Pump to uh, show you. Uh, and then the, the museum chapter was because I was collecting all this. I wanted stuff that represents voices differently than like the interior of the subject. I wanted to get out of interiority, uh, but I also wanted it to be about voices. Uh, and so I just started collecting things. I remember I do this all the time where I just post queries on social media as well, because I'm not as hip to the art world as many of my friends are. Um, and, uh, so I collected all this stuff and I started looking at it. And I remember even asking Nina Ketchadorian for suggestions. Uh, and she did not recommend talking popcorn, which is like, that's very humble of a established artist to do that. Like normally you know, people recommend their own work and they should. Um, but that actually became a, you know, sort of centerpiece of that chapter. Uh, and I highly recommend checking out the work if you don't know it. Um, but I collected all this stuff and then I'm like, well, what's my argument going to be? Well, there isn't an argument. The argument is we should do this differently and hear all these examples. So I could perform, I could do the sort of standard humanities thing of like a, a, uh, you know, I'll do close readings of these things and I'll historicize them and I'll put them in their place and I'll present them to you. But the argument was really quite simple. Uh, and so instead uh, I thought, well, I'm really just doing a show and tell. Why don't I make it a show and tell? So I started with the imaginary exhibition. 
I at some points it was at some points the first three chapters were one chapter, but it like very quickly got out of hand. Uh, and it also didn't work because they're each the tone is distinct for each, right? So for that one, I started with the museum thing, but the first time through, I sort of I want to say the first version, I don't want it's not half-assed, like it I tried. Uh, it just wasn't fully there. It wasn't fully cooked. And I have a PhD student who's about to finish her dissertation uh, on the uh, Australian Aboriginal artist, Richard Bell, uh, named Zoe DeLuca. And Zoe uh, was looked at the chapter because I share my work in progress with my students and was like, well, you just need to take this much more seriously. Like it really needs to be an exhibition. So we need the plan of a museum and then like I'll map it out for you, which she did. And I credit her for that. Um, and then I was like, yeah, okay, I'm going to take it super seriously. So everything in that chapter is either like, I mean, it's all an authorial conceit, right? Because muse museography is always much more concise than I could ever be. Uh, and uh, um, the, uh, uh, the like press star for more information audio guide like you're not actually going to get like the sort of uh, theoretical uh, detours I give you uh, on a on an audio guide although I do sort of have a fantasy of making the imaginary exhibition a real exhibition now that I've sort of plotted it out um, and there probably are galleries I could talk with in Montreal about doing that as a sort of curatorial exercise um but yeah, it was really like me struggling to say, I want to present you with a lot of material. Uh, the argument is simply to like, okay, there's this um, ideology of vocal ability. How, might, uh, how else might we represent the voice or think about the voice? Here are some ways. Uh, and uh, that was that. And I'll just say the user's guide at the end came because I asked people, uh, well, so there was no conclusion to the book. The book ended, the original version of the book ends at the end of the fatigue chapter, uh, which if you haven't read, it ends with a haiku where my cat, Yaya, may, may his memory be a blessing, vomits on me. Uh, and that's how the book ends, right? Just as like a final discrediting of the author. Um, uh, and uh, I loved it. And the reviewers were like, this book needs a conclusion. <laughs> And like, I do it untold. So I was like, okay, but I don't know what the conclusion should be. So then I like started looking for great conclusions to scholarly books. And like for all the scholars out there, I challenge you to go to your bookshelf and uh, find all the books with fan, like really fantastic conclusions. It's really hard. The conclusion is usually not fantastic. Uh, it's usually... It's just not a well-developed genre in humanities writing, I don't think. The one really spectacular uh, conclusion I found was at the end of Jennifer Lena's, I think it's called Measuring Culture. Uh, she's a sociologist of culture, popular music scholar, um, but the, her book doesn't really have an introduction. Uh, but then neither does mine. And so I was like, okay, so I could go that way. And it's like, really, it's like didactic and clear and like, a great conclusion but i was like that doesn't feel right for this so then i was like okay i need another genre and so the genre i chose was user's guide i'm not the first academic to write a user's guide i mean there's like the gender my gender workbook and there's a whole tradition of doing that um and actually the model for me was uh, the manual for a piece of software called, and I just learned how this was pronounced because my partner, Carrie, just got back from Finland, but I'm going to get it wrong, but it's spelled A-A-L-T-O, uh, Alto, but that's not how the Finns would say it. They would say it very differently. Anyway, that software, that software is a beautiful manual, which itself is modeled on a manual for the Buchla Music Easel written by Alan Strange. And I said, that's the format I want. And so I actually, and also because like in my technology work, I'm reading manuals and instructions all the time. And so it's like, I'm gonna like commit to the genre. And that's why you have instructions for disposal. You have like future updates. You have all that stuff in there. Cause I was like, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. And it forced me to be even more didactic than in a scholarly introduction. And um, 
I think that, you know, parts of, parts of the book probably don't teach super well. I think that one probably is like set up pretty well to take into a class because it actually has exercises in it and everything. So, um, so that was like solving a problem um, and ending, trying to find a way to end the book that I was satisfied with because I didn't want to like launch into scholarly Jonathan after Yaya uh, uh, emptied the contents of his stomach onto me. So, um, so there you go. Um, yeah, yeah, That's I'll funny. stop there. I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about the introduction. I thought like, did I miss it? I looked many times. <laughs> I wanted no introduction. I wanted it. I wanted to begin in the middle. Yeah. But then like like Netflix like, series kind of or something. Introduction space. Yeah. There's an introduction in the first chapter. We even took the acknowledgments and put them at the end of the book because yeah. to get you to that front thing faster. Mm -hmm. uh, that was also intentional. Uh, and I'm just lucky because you know, uh, Duke was very, uh, accommodating about that kind of stuff. And, uh, my designer whose name I'm forgetting, but is in fact on the page, uh, <clears throat> uh, where is he? Matthew Tauk or Touch. Uh, he was great and was like, ran with, I said, like, these are the things I kind of want to do. And he ran with it. And I also worked with artists, right? Lachlan Jane did that thing, the things that are seven centimeters in the uh, first chapter. And then um, Darsha Hewitt illustrated the conclusion um, and also did the, did a proper uh, mock-up of the museum layout that Zoe conceptualized. Um, and uh, like, there was a point at which I thought I wanted to write the book with a visual artist and like go back and forth. But I don't remember act, when you were talking yeah, about that. Yeah. Yeah. But I actually don't think this was the book to do that. I don't mm -hmm. know what the book will be, but this is, this was not that. So, so now you're doing a uh, collaborating book with a musical artist who's also a visual artist. Uh, so what kind of changes in your writing practice is that? I mean, we both collaborate a lot, so that's not that, I mean, it might be interesting to other people. That's not that unique for either of us, but uh but have you written, and you just wrote with Juliana too. So it sounds like you're publishing with like musicians more. Uh, more yeah, I suppose. Um, yeah, I guess, yes. <laughs> I think that, you know, I have a problem with, I love words, I love sentences, I love paragraphs, I love chapters and sections and chapters and books, but I also really have a problem with words and um specifically like what they look like on the page <clears throat> because oh no i shouldn't say i have a problem but there's it's so impactful is what i should say the way that words uh, look on the page so and then we have the issue of which words to choose when you write about sound write about practice write about the things we write about so I'm deep in that still, <laughs> always. And um, part of trying to work with and through that is to, to work with people like Wadalia Smith, who has thought about this in terms of um, musical notation and what that looks like on the page and what that does to, to music and to the musician and, and to the composer. And another part of how I do that, it, it, like work with and through that, is to work very closely with a um, graphic designer called Juliette Belloc. <clears throat> so, it, 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 yeah, we can't get away from how impactful just the thing that meets the eye is. So if you write horse or you write horse or you write horse and it's presented in different ways, there are three different horses. And how do we get to the horse that we're trying to communicate? That's what I'm trying to work on and also i'm trying to work on what the meaning of that word is without the type without the visual visual part of it uh, sorry without the type visual part of it and i try to that's why i'm so <clears throat> interested in so many things you have done too because there are different types in your figures especially the museum i love that type <laughs> you can totally see the blueprint type right and um um so so how can we communicate visually without words 
or how can the layout and all those things help in the communication or move the communication in the direction that we are desiring. Um, and um, and then the audiobook format. I'm I love audiobooks because I think you can just get something that I can get something that I can't get when I have to see the type. I feel like I get the type is like a screen in front between me and the content somehow. So I were uh, I'm experimenting a lot with this, um, and um, I could show you maybe how. This is what Adelio Smith, but um, before we go there, maybe <clears throat> with Juliet Belloc, um, this is just, um, we work, uh, th these are from, um, from the first book, Sensing Sound. Um, one of the kind of thought pieces that return is around the tree falling in the forest, you know, and if it's, if nobody's there, does it make a, a sound? And to me, that question, that philosophical question has, is the epitome of how we re how we reduce music to sound and um you know there are lots of questions to ask about the tree so if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it does it still have the same taste and what about the violin is the violin a violin when it's a tree um and um so we this is Juliet. so we this was in the depth of the pandemic <clears throat> where we were working on zoom and we met in the forest <laughs> And we're making models. This is about the metaphorical project I'm working on, trying to make models, physical 3D models of how things connect and and not don't connect. And and then here um, we're trying. I was trying to, you know, trying to write about something that is moving through material and is changing. I need other models to think through that than just. <laughs> just the music um, and just the words. So I'm trying to think of different ways to perform it for myself and to be able to then maybe get the words from there because I know in the end, words is one of our major currencies. <clears throat> so I was just in the yard using water and food paint, food dye. And then this is water and food dye and, and different lighting situations throughout the day. To, to think about, and this is a kaleidoscope, which is actually behind me, the black thing on the mantle back there, trying to, to see what happens and trying to see how I can maybe describe music through that, that place. And here's um, <laughs> our setup. This is my son working with me. And um, this is all to move to being able to um, think about what other Leo Smith's work and here's here's what other Leo Smith here are some of his scores and um, here's a piece he wrote for me and uh, a voice piece and he calls this the voice box it does look a little bit like the voice box and this notation there's some that is not represented here that does use stuff but this notation is called uncrasmation and this is his invented notational system and it uh, is relational rather than fixed so it doesn't pretend what um, our um, staff, Western staff system pretends that we can know a sound uh, prior to knowing the specific material um, relationship that is taking place. So just to give a very brief, um, very simple example, there are long notes and short notes. So in order to know what the long note is, you need to know what the short note. I'm sorry, a long yeah, a long note. You need to know the short note and vice versa. So they become what they are in relationship to one another. And there's um, deep complexities to this language, which is, which is what, what we're talking about in this book. Um, and I am, <laughs> I am working through trying to describe this and trying to describe it, uh, still being able to talk to people, but also not being, um, not being um, constrained and limited to what the words I'm using have meant in the past, because they're mean things that I don't want them, that I'm not trying to say. So this is a huge um, <laughs> uh, challenge and um, so much fun. I mean, <laughs> and I think so necessary. So many of us are doing this now, for instance, oh, the Florida room, for instance, Alexandra Vasquez, I don't know if you can see it, she's doing this just with her imagery and the poetry. I mean, it's just amazing what she's doing in this book, also Duke book. So there's so many people working through this now. Shauna Redman, you in this, what the thing you're doing here, um, 
Um, so it's a big project that I think a lot of people are working on. And here we're giving a talk and and we're also you know, working through some of this material by actually uh, doing the music. So here we're recording the music, some of his music. And I was trying to specifically thinking about, you know, talk about voice implements, trying to find different filters, but analog uh, filters to sing through and with and see what the voice would sound like if I controlled um, the um, acoustic environment um, in this way. So bowls and aluminum foil and all kinds of things um, that I was bringing with me. So um, yeah, it's. I think I've always worked very closely with artists, but maybe it hasn't been so performed and so like with, um, um, it's not, not so performative, um, but I think the, going back to underwater, underwater opera, I was very in very close collaboration with Julian as well. And um, yeah, I think you're unmuted. Classic. Uh, I've got follow up questions. So in talking about the metaphors, and then the way you talked about language, I think you have a love hate relationship with metaphor. Right, and with the figurative power of language. Right, because you said at one point, I want basically, I want the words to mean what they mean. But then at another point, you're like, I'm interested in the metaphoric power of it. Um, so, or or I don't want the words to mean what they have meant. That's what you said. Um, so, yeah, it's a really like, that's the struggle, right? Is we don't control language. Um, and so, yeah, well, maybe it's not a question. It's just uh, that that was really striking to me, right? Mm -hmm. That. We don't control it. We just sort of, it's this uh, thing happening out in the world and this flow you're trying, you know, it's like sticking your hand in a, in a uh, stream of water or something. You can divert it, but you can't, uh, uh, you can't, you can't uh, exert control on it and it's going to move past you no matter what you, what you do. Yeah. Um, that's a nice imagery. Yeah. Uh, and a part... Part. Well, no, that was a simile. Sorry. <laughs> you need an imagery. Isn't it an imagery? To... It's imagery. I'm... Yeah. Yeah, 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 not the metaphor, but then, yeah. Well, well, I, you know, what I, I'm interested in all that <clears throat> to try to to look at at least some of the ways that the word is pulled. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one might choose the word for one reason, but it's pull is pulling and is being pulled in all kinds of direction and is closer to some things than other things. And then somebody comes in with a certain reading or maybe put the chapter together with another chapter that then pull the words in in another direction. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm interested in, like the undercurrent of where the meaning of words are being pulled and <clears throat> diverted or pushed, mm -hmm. um, clipped. Um, and I think, um, you know, so, so much of, of the ways that fields are being made is by an assumed fixity around certain terms and words. And um, at some point, and, and there might be, I think it's very often naturalized words and terms, that, terms and um, ideas. And that's, you know, one of the things I try to do both with sensing sound and with the race of sound, trying to de show you how <clears throat> we, we, we cannot know an, uh, a pitch without, when, without knowing a whole host, whole host of specific uh, information about that instance. Um, sound moves five times faster underwater so we just an a is not an a even though it's 440 metronome count of 60 quarter note it's not it's a unique instance <clears throat> and um i'm the same you know when we hear a voice and we think the voice is telling us who it is or we we think we know who that is it's that's all these different dimensions, of course, going into that. So I'm trying to do the same, show some of that in terms of words and concepts that are being used in in um, in the way that we think we know music, certain musics. I'm talking about, I don't know, Western classical music or pop music that is also based on harmony or tonality thing that makes us what makes us recognize something as music and i am trying to show now in this one of the new projects i'm working on what assumptions and what kind of metaphorical networks have to be held in place for that to function in the way that it functions for us now and and what we're ignoring in order to have that work for us 
And I would love for you to be part of that. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so, no, it, it's exciting. And uh, I'm excited to see what you come up with. I think that all of music studies is having this struggle right now with uh, sort of it's this inherited apparatus that is not appropriate to the historical moment or the music it wants to talk about. Yes. Um, and so there's a lot of inventing going on and a lot of resistance to inventing as yes. well. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely needed. I've long wanted, I have no idea what this would be. So um, I'm literally telling you everything I have to say on it. I've long wanted to write a book on music, like an actual book about actual music, but I have no idea what that would be or how I would do it. Um, so I'm sort of waiting for the, uh, again. <laughs> um, well, we have to give you an assignment. It sounds like, yeah, so probably, someone, like a... <laughs> probably someone give me an assignment. The only thing I came up with once was, uh, pitching one of the, uh, um, uh, pitching one of the, uh, 33 and a third books on, uh, massive attacks mezzanine, but I actually don't want to do that anymore. So, <laughs> and I didn't pitch it, so it didn't happen. And they do have a massive attack book now, so I think that ship has sailed. Um, but yeah, I think it's absolutely a crucial question. It's something that a lot of disciplines are struggling with as well. I mean, and this even connects to both of our writing about artificial intelligence, which we sort of, uh, uh, I don't know about you, I kind of stumbled into it. Like I didn't plan like, oh, I'm gonna write about artificial intelligence now. Uh, but uh, I mean, it is hot. So like one could legitimately decide to do that. Um, uh, um, but in my case, it was it was like all these categories that are so problematic are just being like operationalized now, um, often by people who haven't thought about them slash don't care uh, with like real, uh, real sort of political uh, implications for the people living with it right and in my case it was i was doing this project on signal processing and like stumbled into uh people starting to talk about applications of machine learning to how sound how mediated sound sounds um and i was lucky in that the local company called lander um was trying to trying to do this with automated mastering and so i could actually study them and that's sort of how i fell into it um i mean there's a lot more to say about it than that i'm uh right now the paper i'm writing is with uh, two of my grad students Meha Sani and andy stool on like what are the humans in machine listening uh because like there's the humanities literature, there's like the human and then there's the machine. But in fact, if you just look at things written by computer scientists and by people build, building machine listening systems, categories of humanity show up in all these different ways and they actually don't add up to a coherent subject. There isn't a subject of machine listening. There's like, there's a psychoacoustic subject at the moment of encoding. It was just like my godfather uh, you know, my, I guess it's Godfather three moment. Like they keep pulling me back in. I thought I was done with psychoacoustics. There's, um, the racialized gendered, um, psychoanalyzed subject of like affect detection and things like that. There's, uh, the, vo there's the vocal tract in linear predictive coding, uh, and in speech synthesis and stuff like that. And then, uh, and then there's like all these human relations built and ideas about human relations built into something like music recommendation or uh, music information retrieval. And that's just like the surface of it. Like so we, we developed this, uh, Mayhack came and took the first shot at like the classifications. We just came up with this kaleidoscope of things and categories and subcategories. It was like way too much. And so now we're trying to sort of distill it into a more, um, digestible article format um but it's a really it's a challenging question and also trying to get beyond the sort of arguments about like post-humanism that have popped up which i'm not i mean i'm really interested i'm really interested in like largely uh sympathetic to critiques of humanist like philosophy or ethics or politics or whatever in a moment of climate crisis um 
but I don't think that means that we need to start talking about the rights of robots. Like, I don't think that's the, or like the agency of the machine as an autonomous thing, right? I mean, it's relational, uh, you know, to shout out to George again, uh, George Lewis, like, you know, he's somebody that you can improvise with machines, but that's a relational thing. It's not an autonomous thing, like totally outside of human intelligence and like, uh, it's tied, you know, it's tied up in a uh, political, cultural, and racial history, uh, right? And so, um, so for me anyway, it was like very much sort of the language thing is one of the things that got me into it. It's like these words are being turned into operational vectors in a in a uh, technical uh, uh, technical scenario. So, yeah. Um, well, then maybe we have the book for you about <laughs> there was this huge um, brahu about the virtual rapper, you know, was cancelled. Oh, yeah. So maybe that's your music, your AI music book. <laughs> I don't think that's the I don't think that's the music book. But <laughs> <laughs> well, the, on music. Yeah. Well, that was yeah. a joke, but um, <laughs> I'm glad I, 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 I marked it. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I've been mostly interested in how how these digitized or AI or virtual or technological tech, technologized voices are impacting dif people differently when we have to interact with them. Um, you know, I wrote about this um, monopoly that has the voice mm -hmm. <laughs> voice component to it, where we have to speak our actions um, to monopoly, and they will recognize some accents and not very much other accents. And you also um, address this in your book, in the most recent book, how the bank, uh, automated bank uh, voice recognition systems are not uh, working very well for you. Is that is that a change now? Or when the, the scene you write about in the book, it's not working very well for you, but is there a change or? Well, two things have changed. One is I think most companies have given up on those systems really? over the phone, at least in Canada. Like it, or maybe, <laughs> I've, maybe I've given up calling telephone yeah, maybe you just do support, that thing. but you know, please explain your problem or whatever. Like I don't, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm asked to speak by machines all the time, but not on the phone. Uh, so I, there's that, like I've, and I mean, without a doubt, speech recognition has improved greatly. Um, uh, but I don't use it. Like I don't, I don't use, I don't use voice assistance and it's not because of a, you know, principled objection to their data collection. It's, I mean, maybe we would get there. It's that they don't work very well for me. Um, I think there are some weird frequencies missing in my mid range or something. Um, that uh, that confuse the systems a little bit because uh, I think lots of people struggle with them. I mean, I mean, and it's sort of the, you know, general, like you used to, there was a time where like if a company rolled out a technical system, it was expected to work and that time is not now, right? Like basically users are free beta testers. Um, and so like none of that voice recognition stuff uh, works seamless, as seamlessly as it is said to. Um, uh, you know, and as a, I, you know, I sort of subscribe to the, the Mary Gray automations last mile argument that a lot of it's actually about undermining labor. Like it doesn't, it's not even a cost saving measure. It's really about undermining like labor control and, uh, the rights of workers and things like that. You know, my, uh, doctors have gone from making voice notes that are transcribed to people to voice notes that are transcribed by computers and the older ones find it hugely frustrating. Uh, for sure. Uh, so it's not just me with my messed up voice, but, uh, but yeah, no. So I, you know, we both have the experience of like not being legible. Yeah. Now would be a great time to move to questions uh, or comments. Oh yeah. Or if um... exclamations. <laughs> you could just put an emoji. Um, I, I, um, while we're waiting for the questions, I do have a question. Of, you said that you are fantasizing about writing a music book, but are you, what current projects are you working on? Or is there anything you want to share about future or current projects? Uh, 
Yeah, I'm in the space where I don't know what the next book to finish will be. Uh, there is the project with Mara, um, but she, her first book's got to come out first. And she also, she's had a heavy admin load. She had some stuff in her life uh, that slowed her down a bit. So I'm not sure that that will be the next thing. That might be the next, next thing. Um, and then I'm sort of toying with a couple things. Uh, I... Uh, have this long unfinished project on an attempt to deliver mail by cruise missile in the 1950s that's like a long essay and maybe actually could be a short book although every time I try to write a short book I fail so I'm a little bit like maybe that should just be an essay I don't know I have I have this I, I have this sort of lost book on signal processing which sounds really if you don't know what it is it sounds super dry but it's basically like it, it it's like a history of color and sound uh, would be the way I would describe it, like metaphorically or the, the, uh, the metaphors I'll use for the book if I do it actually are culinary. Signal processing is the cooking between the, you know, if, and this is true of media studies in general, like if it was the anthropology of food, it would be as if people wrote about like agriculture, gathering of food and then eating and wrote very little about cooking. Uh, and I want to write about the cooking part, which is like how you turn sounds and images into the sounds and images like they sound on our uh, media, because so many operations are happening between like our voices going into the microphones and, and them coming out of the speakers. So I have all these essays that I've written over the last now, I don't know, maybe 14, 15 years, but I don't want to make a collection of essays per se, because you kind of don't need to do that anymore. People can just find your stuff if they uh, want it. And so I was talking with uh, Ken about maybe reworking that a bit. So that's another possibility. And now that I've taken this um, machine listening stuff on tour, I was just in uh, Stockholm and London giving talks on this. Like maybe there is something on machine listening uh, that I, cause I'm, I'm hearing things and I'm seeing things now. And I think, well, maybe there is a contribution I can make, but I'm in that in-between space where I don't know what the next thing is. So for you, it's the book with Wadada, Leo Smith. Is yeah, that it's the that next book thing? and the book on um, this thing on <laughs> showing how 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 music has been naturalized as well um, that I talked about a bit. Um, what is machine listening? Can it's uh, it's uh, using artificial intelligence, which is really branded. Uh, it, what artificial intelligence really is is a specific kind of AI process called machine learning, uh, and machine listening is applying machine learning to sound. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, that's the simplest way to say it. Uh, so it can, it's good at predicting. Well, good. It's used to predict. It's used to identify and to a lesser extent to produce. Like, I know there's all these anxieties about like, you know, AI, AI visual artists are going to replace artists and like AI songwriters are going to replace songwriters. And like, maybe that's true for hold music and TV uh you know tv chase scenes and stuff um i'm not really worried about that in the long term like i think musicians are going to do way more interesting things with the technology than just like spit out the uh you know spit out like sort of mediocre content for platforms or whatever okay let's do questions what do we got? i just don't know where are the where is it oh there is under q, q and a all is right oh i see oh yeah we even got a pronounce name pronunciation thank you so much Ooh, I like Kana's question. I don't know what I think about it. I like it. You'll need to read it to us. Yeah. All right. Uh, you I, I can, can you read it, Ken? No, sorry. Um, I mean, uh, uh, maybe yeah. Jonathan? They're all good questions. Let's do Kena first. So thank you, Kena. Uh, and hi, nice to meet you. Uh, okay, so the question is, first, they say nice things to us. Then they say, there have been gestures to environmental strains in terms of non-human tech, water, machines, etc. 
but can either of you speak a little more to where you see voice studies sitting with respect to environmental humanities and studies? So I, I can just share this book, which is uh, my UCLA musicology colleague, Jessica Schwartz's book. And it addresses this question in one way. It answers this question in one way. It talks about the nuclear testing on the Marshallese Islands and the way that that um, affected the environment and, and people within the environment and related to you, John, people got um, cancer, tracheal cancer from this testing and um, within their um, worldview, the voice is like the heart, the way that we figure or metaphorically think about the heart is uh, the voice has that position for them. So when the voice is damaged um, through first uh, testing and then the treatment, et cetera, et cetera, it has of course big, huge ramifications for their daily life in terms of their voice and their health, but it also has spiritual and, um, and world, um, a place in the world types of ramifications. So I re I recommend this book um, highly. It also happens to be a Duke book. <laughs> Jonathan, do you want to add something? Yeah, I do. Uh, am I on mute? No, I'm unmuted. So Christina Dunbar Hester's new book, uh, which I'm pulling up right now, uh, Oil Beach. Uh, has a chapter on uh, listening to animal sounds and sonar. And she, Max Ritz, who's a geographer, Shirley Roburn, John Shiga, like there's a whole group of people that have written about like the voices of whales and dolphins. Now, I mean, it's not in a totally like non-human context because I mean, I think any, for a sound to be a sound, you need a percipient. And if we're talking about animal voices uh, in a humanities context, you big, you probably need a human being somewhere in order to, to write something interesting. Uh, but the way that the voices and vocalizations of the animals has been used to like generate environmental uh, consciousness, but also naturalize certain kinds of uh, social relations. So Christina's book is just out. Uh, so I'll recommend that. And I know Max is working on a book. Um, and uh, I don't know, where, John had this idea of doing like a whole history of sonar, but I don't know where that's at because he's, uh, he's got other stuff going on too. So, um, so I guess both of our answers are like other people have better ideas than we do. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next question. Um, yeah, do you mind reading it again because of my not at all no i'm happy to do it plus it gives your voice a break okay so george lewis what i've been wondering about with ai music projects was that there seems to be very little interest in real-time classifiers as distinct from generative machines of very sorts i found out that music information retrieval means shazam and not say having an ai do a listening in the way that we think of ourselves as doing that Maybe that kind of listening is improvised. That's why it's hard, question mark. I mean, my short answer, George, is yes. Uh, that's exactly why. I mean, I also think like corporate AI casts a huge shadow over university computer science research, even like what composers are doing in music departments as well. Uh, so that's an issue. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I did see a number of performances on my just European trip where composers were playing, were like built these systems and then the performer would perform with the machine uh, and the machine would in real time like try to generate its theory of music from, uh, from what the performer was doing. Um, and I have to say as a listener, like I talked to the composers and they were like, yeah, this is totally different. This is so radical. As a listener, I'm not sure that like that versus like, you know, some randomized delay lines and like pitch to MIDI uh, to create like new kinds of uh, um, 
to to sort of create some sort of uh, improvised performance. Like I'm not sure uh, sonically I could tell the difference or musically. Um, the interaction wasn't as apparent to me as an audience member, which is I was was kind of surprising given the enthusiasm with which the composer sort of brought the discussion. But it's also possible they're not doing it in the way that you're suggesting. Um, because I don't really that we didn't get into the back end of it. Do you have thoughts on that, Nina? Um, uh, George is saying in the chat here that he was um, thinking about, he says, just to read him, I guess yeah. I was mainly asking you to think about out loud about listening as an improvisation. So maybe I could, <laughs> I, you know, George, <laughs> I wish you were here on the panel, listening as an improvis um, improvisation, if it's about listening about is about um, being in relationship to the world, to oneself, to the material, to past um, events one have listened to, and to you know, imagined sounds and imagined futures, then listening is a very exciting place to improvise. There is so much of all of those ingredients um, that is part of listening. Um, yeah, I just think I, I'm just trying yeah. to imagine listening and how, how multi-sensory, how multi-channeled, how, um, um, how much it plays with time. Um, that it's just yeah, it's one of those ever never ending spaces to be in. Um, Jonathan, I feel like you have something at the tip of your tongue. Yeah, well, I was just going to say what George said, which is all listening has to be improvised. I have a much more prosaic response to the question, which is like listening is like one part technique and rehearsal and like all practice and one part availability. Uh, so there's no way listening could not be improvised. Uh, because it's an, it's it's an engagement with something, um, so that's uh, oh hey we've got a we've got a zoom, zoom <laughs> canine zoom bombing, um, yeah. And then he asks the other issue would be whether there is any listening that is not improvised. Um, I don't know. What do you think, my buddy? <laughs> um, not improvised. I'm going to say no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because even if it's because things change around it, and then it will inevitably, yeah, become. Hey, Ken. Hey, Ken. Hi there. This has been really great. We're about five minutes over, so I don't know if you want to take one last question or uh, perhaps rest the voices. But it's just been really wonderful listening and having such great audience participation. It's up to you if you want one more closer, uh, closer question or you want to just play your closer music. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel like, I mean, if two of them, two more are on artificial intelligence, but I feel like we should, if we do one more, it should be Catherine's, which I'll read out and see if you have anything for it. Uh, for Jonathan and Nina, did you find your work personal experiences with the voice in academic setting bring up questions slash insights about the body in such settings more gen more broadly? It's a good question. Yes. Is it a trick question? I feel it's all about that. <laughs> you had to be entirely underwater. Ex <laughs> not just your voice. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, sound is transmitted and transducted from the water to the bone <laughs> structure underwater. It doesn't go through the eardrum. Um, I I feel like everything returns to that. The, I guess the question is what kind of body we're thinking about, what kinds of bodies we're thinking about, um, which body for whom, at which, which time, and which circumstance, and what kind of e ecological, cosmological even model one is 
imagining that body. Um, th 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 those are just some initial thoughts. Um, I'm going to mute, mute myself because Mappale wants to talk to you. So, Jonathan, I hand it to you. Animal voices. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'll just give a short answer, which is, uh, you know, I academia is sort of my habitus. Like, I am the sort of middle class subject designed to inhabit uh, university position, whatever, whatever. So, for me, uh, I was able to get by for a long time without being aware of my body, and that's no longer possible. Uh, and if you want to, if you actually want to viscerally experience that, if you're at a conference where there's an actual disability studies panel run by disabled people, not not non-disabled people, like giving theories of disability, um, it is possible that you will be able to see how incredibly restrictive academic spaces are on bodies. Um, I just think about something basic like stimming and the amount of work that autistic people are actually asked to do for no good purpose, right? Like if you stim in a classroom, it's not disruptive at all, uh, at least in my experience, like, okay, a person's moving. Well, who cares? Like, you know, pens are moving, uh, typing is happening, like, and yet it's seen as like this very disruptive thing you're not supposed to do. Um, and so you walk into the disability studies panel and everybody's just like being their, being their like crip self. And it's like a very nice and very different vision of what academia could be and what it could be like. So uh, there's something. Okay. Well, that's a great point at which to end. And I just want to thank you both so much and thank everybody for being here tonight. And Hope everybody has a really good um, close of the semester, if that's still happening, and good holidays, and a really uh, happy new year, and uh, thanks to everybody. Good night. <laughs>